This podcast is sponsored by Tusk, a continuity of business solution for industries that struggle with traditional banking. Check them out on the web at tusk.network. The Rob McNeely Program is the nexus of cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, and entrepreneurship. Now, welcome to the program. Today, we are talking to Amal Safi. Is, is it Safi or Safi? How do you pronounce Safi. the last name? Safi. Safi. Um, he is the CEO of a blockchain augmented reality app project called Aircoins, um, which uh, all disclosure, original crypto coin and Tusk are also, you know, members of this project, but I don't generally associate with blockchain projects that I don't actually have uh, confidence and faith in. There's so many bad actors out in the field. Um, but I wanted to talk to him all today about what's going on with Aircoins. I think uh, it's an interesting project and... Uh, Let's go. Amal, how are you doing today? Yeah, it sounds good, Rob. Today, doing well. Thanks for having me today. Uh, yeah, looking forward to chatting, uh, chatting about Aircoins and uh, uh, the future, future of blockchain and crypto projects. So great. So you, um, you said a boot. So that makes me think that you're not an American. Where are you located? <laughs> yeah, we're in, uh, we're in Toronto, Canada. Wonderful. I grew up on the Canadian border myself, so I'm very familiar with that accent. I'm like, oh, boot, he must be Canadian. <laughs> uh, I actually spent a lot of time um, growing up in Canada um, as an American. Uh, when we're, we turn 19, the drinking age is 21 in the States, but in Canada, it's 19. So when, you know, Americans that live along the Canadian border, at least when I was growing up, when they turned 19, they started going to party over in Canada, you know, uh, Windsor this is right on the Detroit border. So when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time in Windsor. Um, but I like Canadians. Um, one of my best friends uh, here in Utah is actually Canadian. I always call him a snow Mexican, but he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's right. so, so give me a little bit about your background, Amal. Um, you know, you sound like you got a really interesting history. So, um, are you a tech guy? Are you a business guy? Um, how did you get into crypto? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we are fortunate enough. Uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, some really good education when I was younger. Our, our high school had a special tech program. So I did, you know, I learned how to program code, uh, you know, sys you know, network, uh, you know, Cisco devices. Uh, you know, we we're exposed to, uh, uh, we we're exposed to AutoCAD and a whole bunch of other uh, tech stuff. So that kind of, uh, you know, starting early on and just having an interest in there and moving on to university where, uh, you know, we, there was a program where it was, you know, half business and, and half tech. So we would learn how to, you know, code in one class and then the next class will be statistics and finance and, and marketing and such. So we kind of got up, you know, we we're kind of really trained for the future of, you know, uh, future of business leaders where you need to connect the tech side to the business side and so we were kind of you know we're we're, we're built for this uh, so yeah you know uh for uh for work you know i was a infrastructure admin so uh f your firewalls uh your server rooms your network connections your vpns um so we've done all that so uh you know we got the technical side and you know this blockchain stuff is is, re is revolutionary and uh it kind of uh, changes a lot from an infrastructure point of view, uh, from applications point of view, and from hosting and just control of data, right? Uh, uh, I, so it's. I agree. You know, you brought up a really interesting point about your background, and I think is missing from so many different projects is that you got a lot of developer led projects out there. In fact, in this space, it's almost entirely developer led projects. And I love developers and the creativity that come from developers. The problem that I see, which is almost endemic with so many projects is that there's no business side to go along with the development side. Um, and, and I think that's, I, I think personally, and I get called a heretic, I think that's part of the problem holding crypto adoption back. What do you think? Oh, I totally agree because, you know, these tech projects are introducing their tokens, but the token economics uh, on the business side may not span out or may not make sense. Uh, and just like any other startup or business, you really need to crunch your numbers. And, uh, you know, a lot of some of these tech startups, uh, some of their, you know, some of their numbers don't make sense of that. It's like, you're, you know, you're, and these, uh, once you release your token into the environment, that's it, you can't take it back, right? So uh, no. these guys are creating these projects, releasing tokens, and they're like, you know, they realize next year later that, oh, shit, we ran, you know, we ran out of our tokens or we don't have any, you know, 
or whatever the case may be. And then additionally, there's your token economics and the utility of the token. And is it, you know, is it just acting as a security for the project or is it actually a utility within, within the app? Can it be utilized already or how are, how are the users going to redeem it or uh, hold on to it or exchange it? So, you know, there's a whole bunch of different angles, uh, but I, some of these projects, you know, miss out some of the important items on there. So it was funny. I went to a, a conference, a, a blockchain conference in Miami, uh, the early part of this year, and it was actually my first big, you know, crypto conference. So I really didn't know what to expect. Um, and so I, I come from kind of the startup world. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and guess what? Most of my business experience is not in blockchain. So you know, and I'm straight up about that. But I have built and sold some companies and, and made a little bit of money along the way. So to me, um, I always look at it from the business side first, the business case first, because tech should support the function of the business. Um, and so it's funny when I was at that conference, um, I started, there was a lot of, you know, booth space out there and a lot of people at that point, everybody's trying to do a token sale, right? Um, and I started talking to some people and I'm not gonna name names at this point, but I started saying, oh, tell me about your project, right? And they're like, oh, we're, you know, Uber on blockchain. Okay, that's interesting. Why? What do you mean? Well, why are you putting Uber on blockchain? And, and they are like, well, you know, Uber takes a lot of percentage of the revenue. And I'm like, so? Well, decentralized. And I go, does Uber not provide some value to the drivers? But blockchain, yeah. <laughs> and it was like this circular argument. And I just said, well, how much are you going to take? And they're like, oh, like 3%. And I go, so you just want to be Uber that provide, but you provide no value to your drivers and you're going to take less for it. And so yeah. that kind of raised red flags with me. Like your business model can't just be an existing thing on blockchain if the blockchain piece doesn't add, in my opinion, significant value. What do you think? Yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's a really good example of some of these companies trying to come in and say that, hey, blockchain is going to solve uh, you know, it's going to decrease uh, or make efficient or, you know, decrease the price of, you know, certain services. Exactly. Uh, and it goes beyond the, the blockchain should actually be a back end sort of if the user shouldn't even have to kind of uh, acknowledge that you can say that, hey, it is. Yes, this asset is on the blockchain that might you know add a little bit of credibility to uh, the platform, but it's not going to, you know, it's not going to change you still need the front end applications you still need it's like saying hey my app runs on the cloud right it's it's a given if it's not running on the cloud then you know what you know what are you doing uh right. same goes with uh you know same go, goes with systems on the on, on change on chain a lot of the applications will, will make sense uh, a lot of them won't and uh yeah the you know the use case uh of the chain you know it yes the blockchain can alleviate a lot of the infrastructure overhead and stuff but first it doesn't make it doesn't make sense for all you know all kind of existing business models it's it's uh, you've got to be selective and it's really got to make sense you know the blockchain's got to really make sense in terms of uh storing assets or storing information on chain well, well it has to have a purpose and you know it's funny because you know it's like any kind of, I think crypto is a lot like political movements and, and I've been a political activist. So I've been around activists for, you know, decades, literally in the political sphere um, as a hobby. And it, it's interesting because activists tend to, you know, get locked into one view of things and one particular view of things. And, and I think what, what happens is whenever you have a movement or a paradigm shift, and I don't care if it's religious or political, or in this case, technological, um, the activists are a necessary component because activists are willing to take the social risks of creating the change, right? You know, and so, but it's funny because activists are the first ones, once something gets matured, whatever it be a religious movement or tech movement or what have you, the, the activists are the first one to get pushed out once it matures a little bit. Now, I've seen this with politics. I've seen it with the cannabis industry. I've seen it now with crypto. And so what happens is the activists who spent all, you know, all this blood and passion and tears and, and literally years trying to make some big change happen, once they actually get successful at it, and then I say the grown-ups come into the room 
um, and then start, I, maybe this, I'll probably get hate mail for this, but professionalize it, you know, establish some paradigms and rules, which then allow the main, basically whatever that is to become mainstream. Uh, and it's an, it's a necessary process. It's kind of the life cycle of paradigm change, right? But what ends up happening, it's very rocky. And, and what ends up happening is when the activists feel, the activists that once they have some success, feel like they're losing control of their baby, they overreact. And I see that happening with crypto now. You know, the, the Bitcoin maximalists are, are, in some of the cases, the worst little babies in the room throwing tantrums all the time about, it's got to be my crypto that I like. It's got to be this one crypto. It's got to be Bitcoin. And it'll always be the greatest thing next to sliced bread. And there's no room for anybody else. And if anybody else comes into the room and, you know, basically competition to their baby, they just, you know, insult it and, and, and get nasty about it. But I think it's a, it's a kind of a necessary process. Um, and... The, the thing that it's, it's interesting with me with a lot of these business models is that, you know, not everything is better decentralized from the user's perspective. And I think you were kind of hinting at this, is that so many of these um, projects aren't better on blockchain. They're worse on blockchain. Um, and so, I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you think about that? Well, are you like a blockchain for everything decentralized, all the things, or are you just, where do you come at on this? Yeah, so uh, I, I I believe in I believe right now we're still in the early stages of uh, the overall development uh, of what blockchain and, and cryptos can do. Right. Uh, just like just like network protocols, how the network protocols evolved uh, and got better and better. You know, we once had a, a token ring protocol where the information passed in circular token token pattern. Right, such a pain to set up, weren't they? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> exactly. I'm old enough. So I'm old enough to remember that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like the cryptos are going to be the same too. We're gonna it's going to evolve, and the chains are going to become faster and faster. But one one common mistake I see a lot of these crypto projects doing, if they're storing information on chain, is the chain write and read speeds. Right. Let's say you can write to a chain, uh, let's say in two seconds, and reading it is only going to take a second. But you can only handle 10,000 reads and writes every second, right? So mm -hmm. that might not be viable for if, if you have 100,000 or a million customers on your platform now. And, you know, the demand for read and write on the chain becomes, you know, a million, you know, a million transactions per second. And the current chains can't handle that, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to migrate to, you know, if you're built on Ethereum and either the cost is, is too high or it's too slow, you're going to have to be forced to move to, let's say, EOS. And then EOS might not be fast enough. So you might have to, you know, there may be another chain that's more faster or more, you know, so just like the evolution of network protocols, I think you're going to see the evolution of, uh, of crypto protocols too evolving and, and companies jumping on these faster chains. Well, I think that's, you know, you bring up a great point with the delegated proof of stake versus proof of work blockchains. Um, with our project Tusk, we're going delegated proof of stake because it is at least equivalent or better than current payment systems and we're focused as a payment system. So to us, you know, you can't even think about proof of work for that application. You know, it's funny because Bitcoin was originally invented as a payment system and it's really bad at it. It, it might be really good for really large transactions, um, where time is, doesn't matter, but from person to person or retail to person, you know, B to C type transactions, proof of work blockchains at this point don't really work for that application. Now there may be band-aids, you know, lightning network and, and some of the other second layer stuff that they're coming out with may work, but they're super complicated. They actually make a tremendous amount more work for retailers and end users. Um, and I think this is where like the Bitcoin maximalists they don't want to look at anything but some kind of solution for Bitcoin instead of looking at maybe this isn't the best tech for that application. And I think that holds some of the innovation back. It's like saying, and I've used this on socials that, you know, Bitcoin maximalists say that the only good car ever created was the Ford Model T. <laughs> and that's all you can work on. And the only thing you can do is improve the Ford Model T. And there's other people that are like, well, maybe we should make a new car or maybe there's a Ferrari or, you know, a Mercedes, but no, the maximalists want that Model T and that's the best that can ever be built. Um, and I think that's ridiculous from a technological standpoint. What do you think? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of factors that affect, uh, you know, 
uh, user user adoption to we really it, it really comes to convenience in today's you know technical kind of world if it's if it's hard to understand or hard to use then the adoption is not going to be you know where I you know even websites with you know a second or two second delay you know the end user can get irritated by just you know slight delays so we really need to make this I uh, really need, need to make the environment really easy to use and really to kind of uh, uh, grasp and uh, yeah, show the benefits uh, to, to, the end, to the end user. Well, I tell people that for mass adoption to occur, um, you know, for someone to adopt a substitute, especially when they, especially when they don't recognize that they even have a problem. So let's start there. Crypto does, is not really solving a problem for most people. Most people don't recognize that they, they have a problem that needs to be solved, let alone by crypto. Um, you know, grandma in, in most countries can, you know, go to the store and buy whatever grandma needs with her debit card. And she's very happy with the process. She doesn't think twice about it. Um, I kind of say, look, if your payment system, let's just talk the killer app, right? The killer app for crypto originally is like payments, right? That's the biggest, best use case. You crack the mass adoption on payments, you know, you have, have changed the world in my opinion. And that's why no one's reached it because it's a really hard kind of level to, to, that's a hard nut to crack, so to speak, as far as getting adoption on that because payments are so fundamental and ubiquitous. Um, but if you want to compete with existing systems, you can't be worse or harder from a user perspective because you won't get adoption. And then on top of that with substitutes, you can't be just as good. So if you're just as good as Visa for the, from the user perspective, um, you're still not going to get adoption because you, because of inertia, because of learning curve, people just don't see the need to change and learn how to use that new system and download the new app. And, you know, so for adoption to happen, you have, you have to be superior in some way or multiple ways to offset or, you know, unseat the existing incumbent, you know, paradigm. Um, and I've tried to explain this to like, especially the hardcore OG maximalist types, and they just get pissy but you know <laughs> if you're going to make it harder for people they're not going to adopt and, and i look at it like this you know linux is an interesting example of an activist kind of you know tech thing but there's a reason why i mean linux kicks butt when it comes to web servers right it's the dominant web server platform i believe globally you know apache and all that but the, the thing is talk to me about linux desktop adoption right you know no one yep. uses you know, outside of, you know, hardcore developers. And, and there's, there's real reasons for that. I think crypto is a lot like Linux desktop right now. It's harder to use. Windows works for most people, you know, Apple, you know, iOS works for most people right now, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I bought a, and this is no joke. Like literally I bought a, I bought a laptop, um, a new laptop for a couple months ago. And I said, you know what, I want to get a little more cutting edge of my tech. I'm just going to make it, you know, a, a Linux, you know, desktop or laptop. So I wiped the windows off at the first thing I did, installed a, a flavor of, you know, Linux. And I couldn't get my, uh, my Wi-Fi card to like work. And it's funny because it was, a, uh, and it was interesting is that the Wi-Fi drivers for the chipset in that flavor were actually pulled out of the latest Linux um, distribution. And it took two of my dev friends to help me out figure how to do it because I'm, uh, I'm not rolling back Linux kernels and stuff. I'm just not there yet, right? Yep. Uh, but it took two of my tech friends like days to like make the stupid Wi-Fi card work. You know, I bought a, you know, another laptop or not a, you know, I bought a work laptop with Windows. I turn it on, it works, you know. So, I mean, so in that case, that explains to me a good illustration of really this learning curve with crypto right now is a lot like the Linux kind of thing. And I think if we don't overcome the usability issue with crypto, you're, you're never going to get mainstream adoption. It's just going to be a niche thing. I mean, um, and, yep. and I'm hoping to fix that but it's like you talk to some of these activists they like oh there's no problem people just need to load download this full note on their computer and then download this wallet and then they need to drop it it's it's like no <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely it's not gonna work and just like you know your windows and linux platforms they have their own kind of uh place uh for different applications uh we know that linux is very you know low intensive low process very efficient but you lack the user interface side where windows a little bit heavier on the user interface side to 
make it convenient for, for the user. And I think you'll see blockchain and cryptos kind of be similar too, where you'll have these financial, you know, financial institutions or uh, uh, regular, you know, your stock exchanges may have these blockchains running in the back end. Maybe the user doesn't need to, uh, to onboard themselves. Uh, for example, you know, the New York Stock Exchange, once you get on board, they, you know, New York Stock Exchange is going to announce that, hey, we're running on a decentralized exchange now. But from a consumer perspective, uh, the front-end application, the, the New York Stock Exchange, exchange app, for example, might be the same, but the back end of the stock exchange may be running on chain. So from a consumer uh, perspective, the front end should be the same, but from a, uh, from a, a business or company or organization perspective, if you tell your users or audience and say, hey, you know what, we are storing assets on blockchain now and it's not just centralized. So I think it, it, can, it can bring credibility to current companies uh, instead of, you know, so that's, you know, I, I think it's the companies are going to, uh, my, you know, take these on first before the users start sending each other P2P transactions. I, I agree. And I think, I mean, part of that is, you know, I think that that's less centralized or more centralized. And I think this is where the maximalist, you know, anything that's not 100% quote unquote censorship resistant, they just poo poo, right? They just like criticize it, shoot <laughs> it down. But I think the future is going to be hybrids. Like you're saying, you might have a centralized front end app that's developed for a specific purpose, company, what have you, but there'll be a blockchain running in the background. And, and I think yeah. that that is going to be where this road goes. I mean, and for some specific applications, even for a big company, it might make sense to do that. And I have no issue with that. That's, and that's where innovation is going to come from, right? You know, like it may not be, you know, the, the most decentralized crypto. And I think that there's some reasons why it may, or I think, some decentralized networks don't imbibe trust because you don't know who's involved with it. You don't know who's running it. You don't know that someone's going to manage it well. And I think that's going to keep a lot of people off from, you know, putting their faith into one, you know, one network over another. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree on that. Um, yeah. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, that's why uh, at Aircoins, you know, we've, we've taken the gaming, gaming approach. Uh, where we're storing, you know, storing assets, uh, your gaming assets on chain. So, and, so, so let's get into that. So, yeah. you know, we're getting the weeds, but I want to, I want to pimp Aircoins today because I, <laughs> I, I, I believe in the project. So, why don't we go back to like the kindergarten? Give me the kindergarten explanation of what is Aircoins. Tell me about what it is. Yeah, Aircoins is a game. Uh, it's available on Android and iOS, and you pretty much uh, collect. Uh, digital assets, digital currencies, uh, and augmented reality based on geolocation. Uh, so you would physically go near a, near a treasure uh, and you would open up your augmented reality uh, mode and you would collect it, uh, you would collect the assets in, in AR, just like Pokemon Go. Oh, so it's like, Oh, so Pokemon Go. So, so people are like, so your game, people download, they download the app and it's available for iPhone, Android, and then you can just go for a walk and you can just pick up crypto. Is, is that what you're That's saying? That's it. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So what, what, what kind of gave you the idea for this? What, what, what was the genesis for this game? Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we come from a, uh, from, a, from a gaming background, too, and we had a professional uh, eSports team in, in Canada. So when, when Pokemon Go was popular a year and a half ago, we had our professional gamers go out and, uh, you, know, you know, play the app and see what the hype was about. So we realized the, you know, interaction uh, that the users have in augmented reality plus geolocation. So... You're not just sitting in one spot. You actually got to go out and into the real world and and go to spots and to to collect these treasures. So we found you know the combination of playing with your friends, going outside, having the augmented reality experience, and you know uh, collecting it. You know every time you collect these, uh, you know it's a surprise. Every time you find a new treasure, it's a surprise. Uh, so we've pretty much uh, picking up those success factors and applied it to Aircoins, uh, combining you know. Uh, augmented reality, cryptocurrencies, uh, and yeah, just the whole, uh, you know, uh, whole kind of treasure hunt kind of uh, idea. So 
Um, and it seems to work that the people that have played Pokemon Go and that have played Air Coins, they say, hey, you know what? We can collect real assets, not just any collectible, right? So when did you guys actually launch? How long ago? So we launched uh, in, in, in July, uh, so about five months uh, ago. We've been working on this for the past year and a bit. Um, and uh, since our launch five months ago, we've had 25,000 downloads and we have 20 different, 26 different uh, coins on the platform now. And uh, we're looking to release more of uh, gaming items uh, and in-app purchases. Wow. So you're actually going to have a place where people can actually use crypto for something? You got it. You got it. Yep. Uh, we've already kind of enabled that slowly, but as, as the game uh, evolves, we're going to hold, we're going to have more, much more kind of um, a bigger marketplace where you can do a whole bunch of stuff. And we're going to leave it up to the users to decide their own adventures or their own games. And uh, so that's, that's kind of our kind of uh, approach. So in your roadmap, like, you know, um, people can download essentially the tokens. Um, is it like a wallet built into it or is that like handled internally right now? Um, how does that work? So if I go out there and I start collecting digital assets, is, is the app like a wallet? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the, the app acts as a wallet too. Uh, we are going to uh, start enabling um, uh, withdrawal of the coins too in 2019. So it acts as a, it acts as like a wallet right now. Uh, you can you can be able to withdraw your coins uh, in 2019, and uh, yeah, we're gonna you know we're waiting for you know we're we're waiting to hear from not you know from our users to see what they want and kind of you know uh, kind of give them that and plus this, I think there's gonna be a whole gamification you know layer on top of this. We're just gonna you know keep the entertainment level high and uh, we're, we're we're trying to make it as fun as possible. I, I think that piece is going to be pretty, pretty crucial, I think, going forward. Um, so it's interesting the way you're describing it. It's, it's not only a game, but you're, you're essentially creating a mobile crypto marketplace, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We want, uh, we, you know, we want uh, our, our users to uh, interact with each other, right? So maybe even a multiplayer sort of uh, scene where, hey, you can, you know, you can uh, digitally kind of interact with an, another Aircoins player. You can purchase, uh, you know, you can purchase digital land. You can maybe block off your land. So if any coins land in your, in your you know, parcel of land that you purchased, hey, maybe you get a cut from that, right? Or you can set up barriers or you can set up different, uh, you know, so start having this multiplayer and, you know, air coins users kind of battling out each other and, and playing with each other. Get off my lawn, kid. Yeah. <laughs> get off my lawn. Get, that's my crypto. Um, yeah. You know, I just, I just had this visual, like two orcs, like battling it out in augmented reality <laughs> in my front yard for a couple of, you know, OCC tokens. So I think that could be pretty funny, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so in, what's your end goal roadmap looking like for 2019? So you mentioned uh, withdrawal functionality and more gamification. Um, is that pretty, do you know exactly what you're going to do for 2019? Or are you just guys still trying to figure out which things to implement first? No, we got a, we got a really clear vision as to what we want to do. And I think we got some announcements to share uh, soon too with some big partnerships coming on. Nice. So we're, you know, we, we want to really bring value to the Aircoins community, not just to be able to withdraw the coin, but we really want to give you guys other kinds of values too, right? So maybe, you know, some of the partners, we were, some of the big partners we're talking to, maybe they might uh, make the easy, you know, make it easier for everybody to, you know, even convert to fiat or withdraw, you know, withdraw your coins in with Bitcoin instead. So let's say you don't want to, draw, you know, withdraw your Aircoins, maybe you can, you know, get it traded in for Bitcoin instead and withdraw it in Bitcoin uh, instead of just, you know, your Aircoin. So that's just an example, but we really want to bring you guys as much value as possible, uh, you know, get in and make it really flexible because a lot of these other crypto projects, crypto apps, you really got to jump hoops, right, to get the transaction going or to make your purchase happen, right? If you want to buy, let's say, you know, CryptoKitty, you got to go on, you know, buy Ethereum and you got to download your other wallet and, store your, you know, crypto keys in a separate wallet. But we, in Aircoins, we just really want to make it easier for you guys to purchase stuff, store your stuff, and just really have fun on the app and watch your, watch your digital assets grow. 
Well, I think what you're explaining makes the most sense, especially with Ethereum. And this is where I don't think Ethereum is going to be the main dominant, like, you know, platform for issuing tokens. I think in many respects, you know, and I, and I don't have a dog in either fight, but I think EOS, you know, handles it better. I mean, the fact that every time you want to do something on the Ethereum blockchain, you have to have Ethereum already to move anything. And it's really that's very complicated, especially for new users trying to explain gas and gway. I mean, I mean, we have an Ethereum token right now and, and man, it's still trying to understand the gas versus gway and how to set those things. That's just so unusable for even people that are pretty bright and, and the end, you know, the common user doesn't want to deal with that. But I think for something like you're doing, right. I mean, technically you've got a centralized app. Um, but I think, you know, you could still leverage blockchain because if you, you know, keep, for instance, and, and I don't know how your back end structured, but, you know, if you're, you, you know, you keep the an internal ledger of what people's assets are and then just do settlement as they need to be settled on the blockchain, that keeps it a lot easier. You know, Absolutely. Kind of lot, you know, um, and so I think this is that hybrid thing that I'm talking about. Like, you know, blockchain can still do lots of really awesome stuff and, and the transparency and the security and things of blockchain can still be leveraged. But I think the future is going to probably be hybrid type networks where the front end from the user, I mean, from the bottom line, I think it's hard to match centralized user interfaces. I mean, uh, decentralized user interfaces are just not that great right now. Now, I think over time they're going to get better, but I think these hybrids where you have a centralized front app interacting with a blockchain backend is probably makes more sense for a lot of different projects out there. Um, and but the maximalists out there can't deal with it because it's not censorship resistant. Here's the question: Has anybody censored a blockchain yet that you're aware of? Have you? I mean, everybody. Well, talks that's the thing, right? That's the thing. You really can't because uh, you know you really can't censor it unless you can. You know, if it's using a specific port on the firewall, if it's a specific IP, then yeah, you can censor it from a, let's say you know an ISP level or uh, you know if you can you can you can find the source of a particular kind of uh, chain yeah you can if it's coming from one source yeah you can censor it but that's the power of these things right you can't censor it you can't stop it uh but, but again you know go ahead well i was just gonna say like the if you talk to the decentralization you know bitcoin maxi activist types the number one concern is censorship resistance but i'm saying has it ever happened from like a government censoring a blockchain. And I'm not aware of an example where that risk has ever actually been manifested somewhere. And, you know, so I'm wondering if the concern about, um, you know, censorship resistance is an overblown concern, but, you know, we'll have to see. But I, I just wanted to get your picture on that because I everybody, you know, talks about that, um, but I've never heard it happening. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit impossible because you can't, yeah, you can't intervene unless you built in, uh, you know, and you built in mechanisms for intervention, but uh, you really can't, right? It's just the public kind of, the public kind of, it's in public hands. So, uh, but uh, you, like you said, the hybrid, you know, the hybrid approaches, and that's why you have all these guys wanting to regulate, but they want to understand it first before they step in and do anything. But most of the cases, a lot of these chains, you can't really, you can't censor, you can't. The only way to stop, let's say, Bitcoin is you got to stop the internet, right? You got to, you know... <laughs> So, well, I think the bottlenecks, you know, and they're going to do what they're going to do. They're going to regulate exchanges, and, and and that's interesting, you know. I, and here's the thing, and, and people are going to hate me, but how many how many exchanges have exit scammed? <laughs> I know of at least three in this last year alone. Um, exchanges that just walked away with cash. It's, you know? Yeah, it's pretty tricky because they dig they, they dig themselves a hole, and they you know and. Uh, they really can kind of uh, get out of there. And as everything is recorded on chain, chain, right? If you make, you know, one small, uh, even slight transaction that's not approved, right? That can be visible in a lot of these, you know, yeah. And these, there's been exit scams and ICOs and exchanges and Bitcoin mining farms, just the nature of the business, right? Just, in, you know, it's still early on in the grand scheme of things, but just the nat nature of the business and that, some sort of anonymity that allows these guys to say, Hey, you know what, we're going to do this. Right. So, but it's going to shake up, you know, it's going to shake up these, these little guys and uh, you know, the next wave of uh, the next wave that we're going to see is going to be more, uh, more lean and more regulated and more controlled. I agree. But I think that 2019 is going to be the year of like 
catastrophe for a lot of different projects. I mean, right now the the U.S. government, the SEC has, you know, something like 2,000 investigations going on right now. Basically, under U.S. law, pretty much every single token sale last year in the United States was illegal or any token sale that sold to Americans was illegal. And it's just the government's taking time because they're just trying to unpack all those different cases. And, you know, you know, there's one thing with like, you know, the security stuff, right? It gets kind of complicated, but you know, most of the cases are going after started off. They're going after the scams. There's legitimate scams that also didn't file the paper. Let's just keep paperwork compliance, right? That's what a lot of it is. But, you know, uh, they're going after the people that outright just scammed or just pissed away all the money. <laughs> and, and I think you're going to see, you know, of the thousands of token projects that are out there, I think in 2019, a lot of those are going to go away. I, I think they're either yeah. going to be proven to be scams or going to get shut down for their illegal ICOs or, and I think a lot of them are just bad business ideas. And I think they're just going to fail because of that. Um, and I yeah. think, from that, and I think out of the ashes toward the end of 2019 and 2020, I think good projects run by good people with solid business plans. Oh, by the way, I like business plans, not white papers. So I think the, the organizations that have business plans and um, actual strategies and ideas on how to solve problems, I think those are the ones that are going to be successful. And I think Aircoins is going to be one of them, to be honest. Um, Appreciate. So Amal, where can people find out more? Yeah, so aircoins.co, uh, all our social links on our, is on our website too and the download links. So download, uh, download the app, sign up and jump on the Telegram chat to find out, uh, you know, to meet other people and to see how, where they're going to hunt their coins and uh, share their experiences too. Great. Amal, thank you so much for coming on today. I've enjoyed our chat. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. It was a good chat. I will see you next time. Bye. All right. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the Rob McNeely program. Make sure you check us out on the web at robmcneely.com and subscribe to our podcast at YouTube, iTunes, and on the Google Play Store.